Mm. Anyway, we um, lots of lots of adventures. So after everything you went through in the '90s, <laughs> most people would stay out of politics, but you didn't. Absolutely. I mean, you yes. eventually yeah, ran for president. I, you know, look, I think I felt, you know, compelled to kind of get up and keep going and not to get knocked down. You know, you can literally pull the covers over your head and say, oh my gosh, I can't deal with this. Or you say, screw you. You know what? I'm getting up, I'm getting dressed, getting my hair done, putting my makeup on and going out there. What's your plan for tomorrow? Are you a leader? Or will you follow? Are you a fighter? Or will you cower? It's our time. Take back the power. What's your plan for tomorrow? Are you a leader? Or will you follow? Are you a fighter? Or will you cower? It's our time. Take back the power. We won't be pushed up to the side. What's your plan? Take criticism seriously because you may actually learn something, right? Yeah. I, I, I say that all the time. But don't take it personally because it can knock you to your knees if you take it personally. And you begin to doubt yourself. Everybody has a motivation. The motivation can be petty. It can be ideological. In my case, it could be partisan. But that can't affect your core about who you are. You being a, a woman president, um, I've heard it before said about you, what if she makes decisions based on emotion? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. A lot of people don't even think I have any. <laughs> I love that. She spoke at Democratic dinner. These women, they were great to have around. They were people that I um, identified with. You know, they got it. You know, we as women have a lot of things in common. There's always a message we get about we're too this or too that. Wait your turn. You smile too much, you must not be serious. You don't smile enough, you must not be friendly. You talk too much and you're too serious and you know, I, would, I wouldn't want to have a beer with you or I would want to have a beer with you, but you can't run security for our country. Your hair, you know, I've got, you know, Donald Trump's hair, what about that hair? We would get all sorts of advice about how Hillary should be presenting herself, what she should wear, what her voice should sound like, the kind of words she should use, how she stands at a podium, how she modulates her voice. Hey, guys. I will. Thank you. Thank you. We, like, sat through presentations. We brought people in to meet with her. And I'd say, if you could tell her, a woman on the world stage who does it perfectly, then she could emulate that person. And, you know, no one ever had an answer. No one ever had an answer for who that woman is. This is the moment. When folks talk about a revolution, the revolution is electing the first woman president of the United States. One of the most interesting stories in the primary was this generational divide between young women and their mothers. And young women were supporting Bernie, and their mothers were saying, how could you do that? Hillary has to be the first woman president. And young women just had no reflective gender allegiance. Hey, Hillary, I love you. Oh, I love you. Oh, you're so 
interestingly, the women who were excited about the first woman president were either much older or very young. <laughs> Little girls were so mad that there was had not been a girl president. They would come in, they would come in with there was like this placemat that has all the president's faces, and they would bring their placemat to their Hillary events, and they'd be like, "Where is the girl president?" <laughs> girls were really into her. They loved her and they had their little pantsuits that they would wear. And then to make a presentation. Oh my gosh, oh, Sammy. Yes. That is so neat. Oh, I hope, did you get a good grade? <laughs> oh, good. <laughs> <laughs> The Democratic race is just about over. Hillary Clinton has 92% of the delegates that she needs for the nomination. Secretary Clinton, last night when you took stage, there was a woman standing next to me who was absolutely sobbing. She said, you know, it's time. They get tears in their eyes. Right. Do you feel do you feel the weight of what this means for people? I, I do. I do. And it's really emotional, and I am someone who um, has been really encouraged by this extraordinary conviction that people have. It's predominantly women and girls, but not exclusively. Men bring their daughters to meet me and uh, tell me that they are supporting me because of their daughters. And I do think it will make a very big difference for a father or a mother to be able to look at their daughter just like they can look at their son and say you can be anything you want to be in this country, including President of the United States. Primaries drawing to a close tonight with California contests goes in 60, to Hillary Clinton, with victories State, in four primaries in on Jersey, Tuesday. New Mexico, South Dakota, and tonight, Hillary Clinton burst at least partway through that glass ceiling she's always spoken about, becoming the first woman to clinch a major party's nomination for president in this country. The first thing I, I did as, as I came in was sort of huddle with my team about the speech because... It was a historic moment, and it had never happened before, it, and we wanted to capture that. And I wanted to link it to the past and everything that people had sacrificed and worked toward, which in many ways was culminating. I mean, Shirley Chisholm was the first person on the Democratic side to run. And then I thought about, you know, Jerry Ferraro, the first woman on a vice presidential ticket of a major party. I was just on the brink of tears. I thought, wow, this is, this is more than I could have ever imagined. Right as I was ready to go off, you know, into the room, uh, I remember Kuma grabbing me and say, you know, just take it all in, just take it all in. Thanks to you, we've reached a milestone. The first time, the first time in our nation's history that a woman will be a major party's nominee. I know then you had to pivot to campaigning against Donald Trump. You right. Can just talk about that right. experience. Well, he entered the campaign with such negative energy, so much vitriol. 
I think the only card she has is the woman's card. She's got nothing else going. And frankly, if Hillary Clinton were a man, I don't think she'd get 5% of the vote. The only thing she's got going is the woman's card. And the beautiful thing is women don't like her. He clearly felt comfortable attacking women, relished in denigrating women. Then he's turning on me, saying that I'm running as a woman, or I'm using the fact that I'm a woman. And so we want to lead into it. I wanted to say, yeah, you're right, I am. We're ready. Oh, so gotta get her out before they come. We need to get, yeah. We need to go, guys. Yeah. Yeah. Now, the other day, Mr. Trump accused me of playing the, quote, woman card. <laughs> Fighting for women's health care and paid family leave and equal pay is playing the woman card, then deal me in. Donald Trump joins us now on the phone. Well, I haven't quite recovered. It's early in the morning from her shouting that message. The way she shouted that message was uh, not ooh. If you go back and look at some of um, Donald Trump's comments. She wouldn't even be allowed to run if she weren't a woman, you know, which is crazy given her experience and his. But nobody really blinked at those kinds of statements. Hillary was a leader of the feminist revolution. People forget it. You know, in the 90s, there was an element of radicalism to her feminism. You know, she was too right too soon. <laughs> this Christmas at the White House, Hillary Clinton seems very much the traditional first lady, not the barnstorming brains behind national health care reform. I want to welcome all of you to the White House. Uh, we this year chose the theme of the 12 days of Christmas. After the failure we had, in universal health care, I felt terrible. I felt like, okay, I can't take on another project. I got to figure out what I can do that makes sense. So I did regroup with my staff, and we had a series of meetings that, you know, were painful and tearful and difficult. We all discussed kind of how are we going to go forward here, and we decided that you should go overseas pursue this passion you have on women's rights. In other news, the First Lady's goodwill visit to South Asia has taken her to India. The second leg of a five-nation South Asia tour for Hillary Rodham Clinton and her daughter Chelsea. I thought what a great experience it would be for Chelsea if she could go with me. I had never been to any of those places, so it was all new to me. This is the first time a U.S. First Lady has been to this region since Jackie Kennedy visited in 1962. Mrs. Kennedy handed out lollipops to children and rode an elephant side saddle. Mrs. Clinton is seen as more a woman of substance, campaigning for better education and health care for women and children. I remember being in this remote part of India, and women walked 13 hours to see and meet with Hillary Clinton. I agree with all of you that women no longer should be silent. Is this the one I worked on? Yeah, 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 yeah. I was along on that trip. You know, we had the First Lady's press corps. And we land in Pakistan. And she went to a school for girls. And they wanted to be doctors, and they wanted to be lawyers, and they wanted to be teachers. They were just like any smart young women but in a country that didn't allow that. Oh, so you have two of your daughters who graduated already from this school, but now they have no further opportunities. I remember she was blown away by that. And it was something that was very close to the core of her soul. First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton continues her 12-day tour of South Asia today with a stop in Bangladesh. What does it mean to, to have Mrs. Clinton come here? <laughs> nobody came into this village. This is a part of the village that nobody will ever dare to come. Now comes the first lady of the world, they say. The first lady of the world is coming here. So we are important. And now they're, they're standing tall because all of the world is watching. Her international travel becomes a balm. 
everywhere she goes, they greet her rapturously, and it's healing, I think, in some ways for her, because suddenly she's not being told she's you know, a liberal shrew who is outside of her lane. We had a great group of reporters with us, and they had a lot of interaction with her. You know, saw her let her hair down. And a lot of them said to me on that trip, she should do more of this. I mean, people should see what we see. She was much different on this trip than I'd ever seen her before because the plane was off the record. We would get into all kinds of conversations, and Chelsea was there. I got to see her be. Chelsea's mom, and she's a really great mom. Certainly growing up, I had seen kind of personal attacks about my mom for her appearance, her working, her presumably also like not being a very good mother, like, oh, poor Chelsea, she must like have no time with her mom. And I thankfully remember that being like totally ludicrous, like to tell me anything about like my mom, who is this like super present, super warm, like, amazing mom and from a very early age i just realized like what people say or assert you know maybe like not even remotely reflective or related to reality it was an amazing trip and without knowing it very serendipitous because when i was asked to speak at the beijing women's conference i had this very recent real world experience about what was facing women in places like South Asia. So Hillary's invited by the Secretary General of the United Nations to speak to the fourth UN World Conference on Women. You're honorary chair of the International Conference on Women. They've got a September meeting scheduled for Beijing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Will you go there? I don't know yet. Well, the White House did not want me to go. The State Department did not want me to go because of China's human rights abuses. So there was almost a wall of opposition to my going. Conservative leaders are still unhappy with the whole idea of the United Nations conference. There's no interest in Hillary Clinton going to this women's conference. It's not an important conference. I mean, that's the great myth about this. No, I think she should not go for all the reasons, the awkwardness of her political and diplomatic position in this, this funny office. We keep saying First Lady, capital F and L, as though it exists. And that's a fairly new invention of the American media. Oh, no, no, but, no, no. Well, no. well I don't think... Hillary would never have sent best I, women I, to precisely. China. Precisely. But, but, but I, this uh, does have... A, a, Eleanor a Roosevelt would have gone. It does, it, precisely. At the same time, we're working on her speech, and there's tremendous speculation about her speech. That speech was shown to no one. It was a very small group of people who worked on it, really small, and we did not have it vetted until we were on our way there. I think that was important because otherwise it would have been diluted. And we were determined and she was determined not to dilute it. I said, I want to push the envelope as far as we can push it. First Lady Hillary Rodham Clinton arrived in Beijing tonight for the largest UN gathering ever, the Fourth World Conference on Women. She landed right in the middle of a controversy over stifling Chinese security measures and over demands that she speak out about human rights. We worked and finalized the speech, didn't get much sleep at all. Did not know what to expect. Those of us who have the opportunity to be here have the responsibility to speak for those who could not. And it starts out very slow. Yet much of the work we there do... There was no response as Hillary started delivering it, and Milan and I suddenly panicked. And we kind of look at each other thinking, oh, gosh. Like, we totally misjudged this. We misread this occasion. We are going to get her in big trouble. She's going to create an international issue because nobody was reacting. They were all just sitting there stone faced. Families flourish, communities. This crowd was all listening to translations. So there was always a delay. They weren't reacting immediately. You know, I kept waiting for it here in Beijing. And she begins to go into this crescendo. For too long, the history of women has been a history of silence. And goes through a litany of what is happening to women around the world. It is a violation of human rights. 
when women are doused with gasoline, set on fire, and burned to death because their marriage dowries are deemed too small. Honor killings, dowry burnings, girls who have their life snuffed out simply because they are born girls. Domestic violence, rape as a tool of war, human trafficking. And as she's going through this, for each of them she's saying, and this is a violation of human, human rights. rights. And you could see the audience begin to come completely enveloped into her speech. If there is one message that echoes forth from this conference, let it be that human rights are women's rights and women's rights are human rights once and for all. She declared that women's rights are human rights. It redefined human rights around the world. You know, I've traveled with her for many years after that, and people would run up clutching copies of that speech, reciting that line from it, like it was a manifesto, a validation of so many tens of millions of women, hundreds of millions of women around the world who have nobody speaking for them. No one ever had spoken for them. The whole thing was just extraordinary. There's a picture of Hillary and Milan Revere and me on the plane going out. And I remember it was a women's moment. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States, the First Lady, and Chelsea Clinton. Today, the American people have spoken. They have told us to go forward. Today, our economy is stronger, our streets are safer, the world is more secure, and thank God our nation is more united. By the time 96 came around, the economic plan was working. People saw it, and the economy was booming. The economic bill was the most important thing. It reversed trickle-down economics, or what they called Reaganomics. Went back to arithmetic, invest, and grow and be prudent, and it sparked the longest peacetime recovery in history. After the failure of the Clinton health care plan, Hillary spun immediately into getting health care for working class kids, the Children's Health Insurance Program. Senator Teddy Kennedy said to me, well, I think I might be able to get Orrin Hatch, a Republican senator from Utah, to work with us. We were able to get it through the Senate, get it through the House, and passed the CHIP program that literally provides health insurance for kids about 10 million a year. We didn't get to universal health care coverage, but, you know, I think the debate we sometimes have, all or nothing, is the wrong debate. How do we get something done in an environment that's very partisan, filled with powerful special interests, and then keep going? Serious crime has dropped five years in a row. The key has been community policing. We must finish the job of putting 100,000 community police on the streets of the United States. Now, Bill Clinton came back to where he should have been all along, and that was in the center of the spectrum. He was elected as a moderate. He was elected because the American people were very concerned about crime. Going back, you know, in the late 1980s, early 1990s, we were having a crack epidemic at that point. Typical scenes in America's big cities. There's a tidal wave of juvenile violent crime right over the horizon. But unless we deal with the ravages of crime and drug and violence, none of the other things we seek to do will ever take us where we need to go. Crime was rampant. Drugs were rampant, in particular in communities of color. The president was hearing from mayors. He was hearing from the Congressional Black Caucus. And they were saying, please do something. President Clinton signed the crime bill into law. $30 billion for more police, new prisons, harsher penalties. For it includes President Clinton's three strikes and you're out provision. It becomes critical to Bill Clinton to come up with a sort of centrist set of policies. And things like mandatory sentencing had strong support on both sides of the aisle. 
I think that people were not cognizant of the fact that you would essentially be filling up the country's prisons with a lot of nonviolent offenders. Were there um, parts of it that should have been revisited and that, you know, had unintended consequences? Absolutely, there were. Uh, and I think Bill has said that, and, and, you know, people who were involved in it have, have basically said it. So there's criticism, and I understand that. I also think that people were then taking out of context things that I said and did. We also have to have an organized effort against gangs. We need to take these people on. They are often connected to big drug cartels. They are not just gangs of kids anymore. They are often the kinds of kids that are called super predators. No conscience, no empathy. We can talk about why they ended up that way, but first we have to bring them to heal. In the 1990s, there was a lot of hysteria about the idea of super predators. It was on magazine covers, um, and she was responding to what was being talked about at the time. Now, what may have seemed like a reasonable thing to say in the 90s, in the light of 2016, did not look good. I was talking about gang members. I was talking about vicious gang members. You don't hear me putting race on it at all. But did you have to then apologize during this election for that? I don't remember. I don't. I mean, I was, you know, always saying, trying to explain things that people didn't want to hear. So. We are all in this together. As we Methodists like to say, do all the good you can to all the people you can in all the ways you can. How are you, my friend? Oh. Please join me in welcoming Congressman John Lewis and Secretary Hillary Clinton as we at Clark and Lawson University continue mobilizing for the future. The leaders of the civil rights movement had it right. Using nonviolence, using the power Black of the feelings. Yes, they do. have any bad feelings at all about the Black Lives Movement, about what they did and how they did it and how they tried to express themselves. The cry to be heard, to be seen, uh, was absolutely appropriate. The rash of killings of young, unarmed Black men was so outrageous and painful. And there needed to be a reaction to that. People are crying out for criminal justice reform. Families are being torn apart by excessive incarceration. Young people are being threatened and humiliated by racial profiling. They're trying to tell us we need to listen. I talked about it a lot, taking on some really tough issues, particularly around gun violence, but by the time we got to the general election, much to my surprise, actually, it didn't matter. Because I was running a kind of textbook campaign. Meanwhile, my Republican opponent was just ranting and raving, and it just sucked up all the oxygen. Hillary Clinton is a bigot who sees people of color only as votes, not as human beings. Trump is so out there. How do you deal with this? This is not an ordinary candidate. Oh, get him out. I like to punch him in the face, I'll tell you. There's so many things that are controversial and, and out of the norm. Crooked Hillary Clinton. Oh, she's crooked, folks. She's crooked as a $3 bill. Now, she's got bad temper. She could be crazy. She could actually be crazy. He's got a, a bullying style and will say anything, and she is the 
Canada of Control. A schoolyard uh, rumble isn't exactly her her normal, you know, venue, isn't her strength. This was one of the biggest debates that I had with myself and that I had with my campaign. What do you respond to and what do you ignore? I mean, I saw what happened to the other Republicans that were running against him. They tried all kinds of tactics to respond, to out shame, to try to out insult. None of it worked. Uh, he seemed almost um, impervious to it. Most of what Donald Trump does is the same thing why a dog licks his balls, because he knows he can. The problem with Trump was his utter ability to drive the news. Donald Trump effectively decided what was talked about in the news every day. Russia, if you're listening, I hope you're able to find the 30,000 emails that are missing. That was during our convention. So what do you think drove news that day? Our convention or Donald Trump telling Russia to hack Hillary Clinton about her emails? Someone like Hillary Clinton, she can't compete theatrically with that. She just can't. Hillary Clinton always has been and was throughout the campaign deeply suspicious of the press. Thank you, everybody. Trump exists because of the press. Hillary at that point said, I think this is going to come down to the debates. Those three debates are going to be the ball game. I thought they were going to be uh, determinative. I thought that uh, the contrast between me and Trump would swing a lot of votes. That's what I thought. We were only a couple points ahead, and the expectations for him were so low that if he had come close to beating her, the race could flip and he could take the lead. He had learned already in the campaign, he wasn't gonna be held accountable. Nobody was gonna hold him accountable except for me. I was the one who was gonna have to try. How did she figure that out? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I yeah, thanks, Donald. That's really nice of you. I had the honor and the misfortune of playing Donald Trump in her debate prep. Philippe immersed himself in acting like, looking like, talking like Donald Trump. He would be unafraid to push back at me, to say and do things that were really offensive and annoying. Are you, you going to share your 33,000 email? I made a mistake in using a private email. I've said this before. Breaking news. The other thing we really wanted to accomplish was to trigger him. You know, we knew he was a narcissist. And so if we could get him flying off the handle, that would show who he really is. That would show his temperament. And you take a look at her segment. website. She's it's gonna raise taxes, one point three trillion dollars. Mr. Trump, I'm look at her website. Go to her website. She tells you how to fight ISIS on her website. I don't think General Douglas MacArthur would like that right, too the much. Next, the next, the next segment. We're continuing well, the subject. Well, at least of, I have a plan to fight ISIS. <laughs> Well, Donald, I know you live in your own reality, but oh, yeah. that is not the facts. You know, to take on this bully, this nasty bully, and to stand up to him, he really was disoriented. It was great. This is a man who has called women pigs, slobs, and dogs. One of the worst things he said was about a woman in a beauty contest. He loves beauty contests, supporting them and hanging around them. And he called this woman Miss Piggy. Then he called her Miss Housekeeping because she was Latina. Donald, she has a name. Where did you find her? Her name Where is Alicia Machado. Where did you find And her? she has become a U.S. citizen, and you can bet oh, really? she's going to vote okay. this November. Okay, good. Let me just tell you.
doing it. Oh, you were great. Verbal. I smiled at you the whole time. I saw you smiling. I saw you smiling. And I saw your dad sometimes leaning forward and putting his head in his head in his hand. No, I just kept smiling. I just kept smiling. You were so good, Bob. You were so good. Oh. She went into that first debate prepared to make Donald Trump look ex inexperienced. They had this idea that if they could get him to be inappropriate or say inappropriate things to, to act out, that it would hurt his candidacy. But that's what he was selling. Now, Mr. Trump, how do you think you did tonight? I thought it was great. I mean, I got everything I wanted to say. I got it out. Other than the transgressions of Bill, I didn't want to say what I was going to say with Chelsea in the room. She's married to a man who was the worst abuser of women in the history of politics. She's married to a man who hurt many women. And Hillary, Hillary was an enabler. So just remember that, folks. Sunday morning, I get a call from my editor. She says, there's this crazy story out there about President Clinton and an intern, and we need you to chase it. And I'm like, <laughs> how on earth am I going to ever write a story? How, this, is, this is a dog assignment, because how could we ever prove something like that? At that time, we, we didn't write stories like that. That just wasn't what the, the mainstream press did. Paula Jones filed a lawsuit. She says the governor of Arkansas made a pass at her. It's just humiliating what he did to me. A judge had ordered the President of the United States to give testimony in response to Paula Jones' allegations. I was a junior guy on the beat, and nobody wanted to touch the Paula Jones story. It just seemed icky and, and not going anywhere. Good morning, Mr. President. Good morning. My name is Jim Fisher. What we learn later is the president is asked during this deposition about a young woman at the White House named Monica Lewinsky. At any time, were you and Monica Lewinsky together alone in the Oval Office? I don't recall, but as I said, when she worked at the Legislative Affairs Office, they always had somebody there on the weekends. I typically work some on the weekends. Sometimes they bring me things on the weekends. She, it seems to me she brought things to me once or twice on the weekends. Did it ever happen that you and she went down the hallway from the Oval Office to the private kitchen? Your Honor, excuse me, Mr. President. I need some guidance from the court. At this now, Clinton point. knew he was going to be asked about her because her name had been on the list that the lawyers had submitted. But what he wasn't expecting was they would ask him so many very specific questions about his relationship with Monica Lewinsky. Have you ever given any gifts to Monica Lewinsky? They clearly knew something, and he didn't know how they knew it. He, they knew about gifts that he had given her. I don't recall. Do you know what they were? A hat pin? I don't, uh, I don't remember. Did you have an extramarital sexual affair with Monica Lewinsky? No. If she told someone that she had a sexual affair with you beginning in November of 1995, would that be a lie? It's, it's certainly not the truth. It would not be the truth. And what we learned was that Ken Starr was looking into it, that the independent counsel was looking into whether President Clinton had lied under oath, had tampered with witnesses, had obstructed justice by trying to cover up his affair with Monica Lewinsky in the Paula Jones civil lawsuit. I remember sitting in our national editor's office, and there's a whole scrum of us. There's no question in our mind to publish a story. But uh, I remember walking home that night around 2 in the morning, just thinking, oh my god, you know, what's going to come now? What have we unleashed here? And sure enough, by the morning, the whole thing just blew up. Allegations of sex in the White House, tape conversations, and Amazing obstruction of Washington. justice surfaced today. A sexual affair White House with intern Monica Lewinsky. President's sexual behavior. Well, the key word there is if the allegations are true. Bill came early one morning into the bedroom. I was not up yet. And he sat on the side of the bed and he said, I, I have to tell you something. There's a story that's going to be in the newspaper uh, that. Um, 
uh, it's about uh, an intern who worked in the White House and claiming that uh, I had a relationship with her. You know, I was just like waking up. I didn't, I, I was like having a hard time processing it. I said, what are you talking about? What, what, what is this? What, what do you mean? He said, well, there's nothing to it. It's not true. You know, I may have been, you know, too nice to her. I may have, you know, paid her, you know, too much attention, but there, there was nothing. And he was adamant and he was convincing to me. I did not have sexual relations with that woman, Miss Lewinsky. He publicly denied it and privately denied it to Hillary, to me, to everybody else, face to face, eye to eye. And he said, just don't quit on me. He said, I'm telling you it's not true. Don't quit on me. And I said, okay. Yes, sir. I walked out. That was a move. 10 second conversation. You've got a White House in total paralysis. At the same time, Hillary had made a commitment to being on the Today Show. And good morning. And good she morning. didn't want to cancel. The last time we visited a subject like this involving your family was 1992, and the name Jennifer Flowers was in the news. And your husband admitted that he had, quote, caused pain in your marriage. Mm -hmm. If he were to be asked today, Mrs. Clinton, do you think he would admit that he again has caused pain in this marriage? No, absolutely not. And he shouldn't. You know, we've been married for 22 years, Matt, and I have learned a long time ago that the only people who count in any marriage are the two that are in it. Now, this is in a way shades of the 60 Minutes interview, right? She's saving him again. It's her validation that allows him to keep going, because otherwise, the pressure for resignation was already rising. The anger within the Democratic Party, not just the Republican Party, was enormous. You know, the president has denied these allegations on all counts, unequivocally. And um, we'll, we'll see how this plays out. You know, I guess everybody says to me, how can you be so calm? Or how can you just, you know, look like you're not upset? And I guess I've just been through it so many times. I mean, Bill and I have been accused of everything, including murder, by some of the very same people who are behind these allegations. That's what I believed. I believed it was part of the whole star investigation, and I was absolutely persuaded because of my own experience, not what anybody else went through, but what I went through, that this guy would make up stuff. If they could make up something, if they could lie about something, they were so partisan that they would do it. You have said, I understand, to some close friends that this is the last great battle and that one side or the other is going down here. This is the great story here for anybody willing to find it and write about it and explain it is this vast right-wing conspiracy that has been conspiring against my husband since the day he announced for president. Facing the cameras for the first time since he began an investigation of the alleged affair and cover-up, Prosecutor Kenneth Starr dismissed charges he is out to hurt the president. I have a very strong belief in facts and in truth, and that the facts will come out and the truth will come out eventually. I believed Lewinsky from the beginning, and I think all of us did. Um, not that we had inside information, but that it just didn't seem far from the person that we knew. Um, and I hugged her and wanted very much to comfort her, but it would be like a mask would come over her in those days. That was in between the disclosure, the public disclosure and the time that he admitted that it was true. Monica! So Monica was my intern. Um, she, um, she was, this is when I was working for the White House Chief of Staff. She did a really good job, uh, very diligent, easy to work with, pleasant, nice, smart. Day 13 of the federal budget crisis and the shutdown that's brought parts of the government to a dead stop. Today, as of noon, almost half of the federal government employees are idle. During the government shutdown, we just had a very skeleton staff but we were allowed to use interns. So I asked her if she would come over and you know answer phones and just help me around the chief staff's office. I think that maybe she had had seen the president a few times before at events or something, but she met him. He came down to, it was my birthday, um, and he came down to cut my birthday cake and that was when she met him. It was a very unusual time. You know, normally 
you don't see the president very often. So in that way, it was unusual to have that kind of interaction. After a few days, Evelyn Lieberman, who was the deputy chief of staff at the time, pulled me aside and said, I think you should tell your intern that she can go home for the day. And I was like, mm, I think. She's like, no, I think you should do that. And so, um, so I told Monica, um, you know, look, it's Saturday, you know, it's a beautiful day, you don't need to be here. And she fought me a little, but she eventually left. Um, but, you know, I didn't think anything of it because, of course, who would think that Bill Clinton could be that stupid, right? Bill Clinton, the first president ever subpoenaed to testify before a federal grand jury in office, will do so tomorrow. He may, in the process, become the first leader in the history of this republic to admit to an illicit relationship with a young co-worker while in office. When the president finally comes around to concluding that he has to tell the grand jury that there had been a relationship, he goes to his wife and messes up. I went and sat on the bed and talked to her. I told her exactly what happened, when it happened. I said, I feel terrible about it. I said, you know, we've been through quite a bit in the last few years. I said, I have no defense. This is inexcusable what I did. I was just devastated. I could not believe it. I was so, you know, personally just hurt and, I, you know, I can't believe this. I can't believe you lied. I, you know, it just, anyway, was horrible. And I said, if this is going to be public, you have got to go tell Chelsea. She said, well, you have to go tell your daughter. She said, that's worse than me. And so I did that, which was awful, justifiably. What I did was wrong. I just hated to hurt her. But you know, we all bring our baggage to life, and sometimes we do things we shouldn't do, and it was awful what I did. Five seconds. Good evening. This afternoon in this room, from this chair, I testified before the Office of Independent Counsel and the Grand Jury. I answered their questions truthfully, including questions about my private life, questions no American citizen would ever want to answer. Indeed, I did have a relationship with Ms. Lewinsky that was not appropriate. In fact, it was wrong. It constituted a critical lapse in judgment and a personal failure on my part for which I am solely and completely responsible. Why do you think you took that risk with your marriage and your child and your, your country? What do you, when you look back? Nobody thinks about that. Nobody thinks I'm taking a risk. That's not why people do stupid things. That's not what happens. Nobody sits down and thinks, I think I'll take a really irresponsible risk. It's bad for my family, bad for my country, bad for the people who work with me. That's not what happens. It's you, you feel like you're staggering around. And you've been in a 15 round prize fight that was extended to 30 rounds. And here's something will take your mind off of it for ten, a while. That's what happens. Because they're whatever life not just me, yeah, everybody's life has pressures and disappointments and terrors, fears of whatever. Things I did to manage my anxieties for years, I'm a different, totally different person than I was on a lot of that stuff, you know, 20 years ago. Maybe it's just getting older, but I hope it was also going through a lot of this, but whatever. But I did, it was bad, but it wasn't like I thought. 
Let's see, how can I think about the most stupid thing I could possibly do and do it? This is not a defense, it's an explanation. It's a, it was awful. I feel terrible about the... The president's extraordinary speech tonight could have a huge impact on the country. He has lied to the American people for seven and a half months. He let down his family, he let down the country. The morning after, people are wondering how damaged... I want to get away, I want to get out of Washington. We did have plans to go to Martha's Vineyard. I had some really good friends there. Chelsea put herself between us and held both our hands. That was not anything other than her just trying to keep us together. And when she did that, oh my gosh, I thought, that's just, that's just so incredible. So strong and so wise. She was filling in our empty space there. That picture is worth a million words. There's a fairly large crowd. Now you hear the applause. And the president emerges along with Chelsea and behind him, Hillary Clinton. Uh, Mr. Clinton turns 52 tomorrow. Normally there is a party, some sort of celebration on the island. The question is just how public the president will be this time. I think he and his wife are keenly aware of the fact that they're being watched. They're in a glass bowl here. I still didn't talk to him. I didn't want anything to do with him. He spent a lot of time, I guess, playing golf and talking to a couple of his friends. I don't even know how in the world she managed through it, because she had to do it on the public stage, not like a normal person who has the misfortune of going through something like that. Every time they appeared publicly, it was, are they wearing the wedding rings? Are they holding hands? What's the body language? That's all analyzed. I can tell you this. In so far as I've ever known anyone well, those two people love each other. If they didn't, it would be so much easier. She's been a figure of controversy, which is why her current standing is so fascinating. Because now, at what may be the low point of her time in the White House, public approval for Mrs. Clinton has never been higher. But even as a victim, Mrs. Clinton still raises doubts. In the latest ABC News poll, 79% say they think she's known about the affair for months. I think people don't really understand what, how hurt she has been personally by him. You know, the, in the Monica Lewinsky case, it's because she's so smart, people always believe there is some deviousness that she must have known about Monica Lewinsky all along and been out there lying to protect him. And, you know, I always thought that would be so much better than the truth that he really lied to her and she really was devastated. And I think to this day, people don't understand that. After investigating the president for four years, Ken Starr's office has finally delivered a report to Congress, a report that could pose the most serious impeachment threat to a president since the days of Watergate. They come back from those couple of weeks in uh, Martha's Vineyard, and she was uh, a ferocious opponent of impeachment, which wasn't just personal, it was really her conviction about the fact that what they were doing was wrong and we needed to stand up against it. I had the extra burden of having been on the impeachment staff back in 1974. I had done the research about what is a high crime or misdemeanor. I knew what the standards of impeachment were. I knew this did not meet it. You know, he shouldn't have done what he did. He shouldn't have tried to hide it, but 
it was not an impeachable offense. What I always found the most amazing is that she could in her mind, or she chose to compartmentalize, to say, I might want to kill my husband, but I don't want the country to have to lose their president because I want to kill my husband. And most people can't do that. I couldn't have. I would have did, I know I would have been small. I would have said, you know what? <laughs> you do this to me, I can take your presidency. <laughs> uh, and I have admired her a lot for making that hard choice. Once he admitted that he had lied, I, I was beyond furious. I was crushed. I loved this man, so believed in him, and really thought about quitting. And not long thereafter, I decided I would. And within minutes, I got a call from the First Lady. She said, if I'm not quitting, you're not quitting. That really meant a lot. And I thought, oh, I got to get out of my own head and realize there's a lot more at stake here. I swore an oath to the Constitution, not to Bill Clinton. And I thought it was a very easy call then, because it didn't merit impeachment at all. The gavel falls on this historic debate to begin impeachment hearings for only the third time in our nation's history, this time against President Bill Clinton. I was carrying on my schedule because I felt it was important. I, I didn't want to, frankly, be portrayed any more as a victim than you know, the situation called for. So I was getting up every day and going out and doing what I could. At that point, her approval ratings are as high as they have ever been. So come the fall in what should be a really difficult midterm election for the Democrats, Hillary Clinton is suddenly the most sought after surrogate speaker for Democrats around the country. Well, I certainly feel welcome. Bill Clinton is too toxic to leave the White House, but every member of Congress wants Hillary in their district campaigning for them. And then the election came, and Democrats won. The American political landscape looks a good deal different tonight than it did just 24 hours ago. Defying history and what a lot of people expected, Democrats make gains and declare a major victory. We gained, see, no one had ever done that. It's impossible. And we did. Not because people thought it was a really good idea to have this really uh, uh, inappropriate uh, affair, but because they thought the response was crazy and they wanted to send a message, hey, cut that crap out. And that they didn't like Ken Starr and Newt Gingrich trying to overturn a national election for something like that. Today, the impeachment hearings begin and the star witness is Ken Starr. And today he will say for the first time that the president did not commit impeachable offenses in the Whitewater, Foulgate, and Travelgate investigation. After the congressional election, Starr sent a report to Congress and said, oh, by the way, in addition to arguing that he should be impeached because of Lewinsky, we want to report that with regard to Whitewater, we found nothing uh, abusive, nothing whatsoever. Judge Starr, you did release what amounts to the exoneration of the president with respect to the Vince Foster matter. Is that correct? Yes. With respect to the cause of death, it was a suicide by Mr. Foster. And you, we, you felt comfortable in exonerating the president? Oh, yes. I was on that committee. Kenneth Starr exonerated the Clintons on everything but Lewinsky. You tell us that months ago, you concluded that, no, that the president was not involved in the FBI files, and you've never had any evidence he was involved in the travel office, yet now, several weeks after the election, is the first time you're saying that. They were a little embarrassed to say, politically, that they were going to impeach the president purely because of the sex. They wanted to say that there was a pattern of corruption. Well, there was no pattern of corruption. I withdraw it, Mr. Starr. I After endless suspicion and haunting, Ken Starr never alleged any criminal wrongdoing by either Bill or Hillary Clinton in connection with Whitewater, in connection with any of the different investigations. Good evening. Well, after all of this, more than a year of sex, lies, and videotape, the second impeachment trial of an American president ended today. And the vote wasn't even close. Not guilty. The said William Jefferson Clinton be, and he hereby is, acquitted of the charges in the said articles. It is important to me that everybody who has been hurt know that the sorrow I feel is genuine.
first and most important, my family, also my friends, my staff, my cabinet, Monica Lewinsky and her family. I defended and stood by him because I thought the impeachment process was wrong, but that wasn't the necessary answer to what I would do with my marriage. It was not, to me, the same. I still had to decide, you know, whether I wanted to stay in the marriage, whether I thought it was worth saving. You know, we saw a counselor. I mean, painful, painful discussions. Well, counseling was one of the hardest things I ever had to do. But it was necessary. She deserved it. Chelsea deserved it, and I needed it. I feel terrible about the fact that Monica Lewinsky's life was defined by it, unfairly, I think. You know, over the years, I've watched her trying to get a normal life back again. But you got to decide how to define normal. I made a decision to stay with my husband. Look, I think that some people <clears throat> thought I'd made the right decision, and some people thought I made the wrong decision. And so I have gotten both affirmation and uh, criticism for the decision I made. And that was true, you know, from the very beginning of uh, deciding that. And, you know, it's it's a funny time we live in. It, the kind of public opinion shifts and people say, oh, you know, so noble she stayed in the marriage to, oh, it's so it, incomprehensible that she stayed in the marriage. You, you know that there's forces at work in the society that people are working through themselves. I, I was so grateful that she thought we'd still had enough to stick it out. God knows the burden she played for that. <laughs>